It is, uh, I heard Don talk about it earlier, it is depend, uh, Independence Day, and um, we, we actually had a little fun with the title uh, of the message. Uh, I know people love when I talk on July 4th or get into anything political. You guys just love it because I'm so North American, just like you. Um, as a matter of fact, Jim DeSicchio sent this to me this week. Um, he sent this to me and Tracy, and I agreed with it 100%. 50% Canadian and 50% American is 100% awesome, and that is uh, me. And so, uh, yeah, so he sent that to me this week. I thought, well, that's a great way to introduce the day. Um, no, I really, I really did want to, uh, as we were looking at this year, and very rarely does the 4th of July fall on Sunday. And, uh, you know, for us, it, it kind of goes beyond whether or not we'd have sparklers at the door or whatever. And we know people have plans and there's things that are going on. And hopefully you'll have a safe and really enjoyable 4th of July. But uh, when it comes to what we do as a church, and you know, you've read our mission statement when you came through, we're here to humbly point everyone to absolute hope. What does that look like when, when talking about Independence Day? And so uh, when I was talking to Chris about it, we were just thinking through just calling it July 4th or, you know, happy freedom, everyone kind of thing. Um, I said, you know, I'm thinking about these two words, dependent and independent and independence in terms of our freedom and Independence Day. And I know that that's an oxymoron, and some of you guys like that, and some of you guys hate that, that we would have done something like this. When you look at how those two words kind of don't go together, even though we've forced them together, um, the definition of dependent is a person who relies on another, right? That's, that is the definition. And independence is the state of being independent. If you go look at independent, it's not depending on another, right? Free is actually the word uh, best used to describe that independence, right? And, and, and yet for me, as I think about the gospel, as I think about um, our salvation, as I think about the church, and as I think about the country, I see something that I believe helps us celebrate our independence, which is understanding, best understanding, our dependence and, de and dependency for that independence. You know, just, and I know you'll agree with me, but as Christians, as followers of Jesus, our independence is 100% dependent on the work of Christ. Nod your head if you're with me, right? So understand, being able to live in our freedom and live in our independence as Christians has to have a dependent nature of depending 100% on what the work of Jesus has done uh, for us. And I believe that's still true even as a country in terms of how much we actually need one another to really experience the freedom and the independence that we really all want. So for the, next, for the first few minutes, I'm just going to talk the way I usually do if I address this. I usually kind of have to get some things open, you know, kind of out in the open first and give us a common place to start because we don't all start here, and we'll talk about why that's a problem in a little bit, but we don't all start here, so just going to start with some simple things that we can agree on, okay, uh, before I get going. But freedom usually has everything to do with our rights. Most people view their freedom in terms of rights. What am I entitled to? What do I have the right to do? Right? Think about across the board, no matter how you view freedom, there's going to be something in there in terms of your view of freedom that kind of gives you, you know, the ability to not have to lean on anyone else and I get to do what I want to do. Think about teenagers. You know, think about teenagers and teenagers as they start to, you know, experience and flex some freedom on their life and their decisions and their choices. And then parents have to remind them very quickly that they do not live in a democracy and this is a totalitarian home. And I am the king, okay? So, so you have to kind of remind them very quickly that that's not how this house is going to work. But you can see it. You know, you can see that there. And it's the same, which is true for all of us. And I think this is true of our country. Most people attribute freedom to our rights. And guys, we have amazing, beautiful rights in this country. All right? And so here's another way in which our country, you know, people in our country look at this, is not just that I have the right to but that the government is responsible for, okay? Meaning that most people, most people simply attribute the rights that they have to the government. That the government has given these or bestowed these or kind of like it's the basis of a framework and therefore also the government is responsible to keep these, to protect these, 
You know, you're not fully wrong about that, but that's, that's kind of the way most people see it. They see it from a standpoint of, well, I have the right to, this is part of my freedom, and, and, and the government is responsible for this because the government is who actually gives us our rights. But if you go back to the beginning, it's not really true. That's not really the way even our forefathers and the, the founding fathers and the people who really slaved over this constitution. And, and, and I, I mean, again, I can't even imagine, I could barely start a company, you know, let alone start a country. I can't imagine what they had to go through, drafts after drafts after wording after wording of some of the smartest people alive to come out with what they came out with, the great experiment as it would be known as, right? Our constitution. But very early on, you see these words, and I don't want you to miss them, okay? The Declaration of Independence starts this way. We hold these truths to be self-evident. I mean, they're, they're, they're there. They're already built in. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their who? Creator. Yeah, by their creator. They have been given, endowed by their creator, with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but there's something there even early on that the founding father said, you know what? Rights, these rights, so to speak, are really not government given. They're, they're already existing. There's something that's given to, to us by our creator. There's, some, there's just certain things that, that we have the right to that's given to us by our creator that, that our, our constitution, our form of government should come along with, should support, should align with. Did they do it perfectly? Lord, no. Okay? They didn't do it perfectly. But that was, you understand, the heart behind it was that these rights weren't necessarily given by the country. They were given to us by God. Right? John Adams was early in the mix. You guys all remember John Adams? Right? President John Adams. <laughs> Good luck. Hamilton fans get this, right? John Adams, this is the picture of when King George finds out that John Adams is, is going to be following uh, George Washington. It's a great song. So go back and watch it later, right? John Adams was in the mix of this in terms of, in terms of helping create this constitution. And I just want you to see what he says. He says, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to, government, to the government of any other. It is wholly inadequate. Why? Because there just seemed to be a common, I say common, now listen, John Adams was not a professing Christian. Everybody with me on that? He was not a professing Christian, as many forefathers were not. But there was something about it that was a common understanding that, you know what? There's these rights that we really do believe are just inalienable rights that are given to us. It's not a government thing. There's something that the government's going to come along with and assist and support. And, and, and when it comes to even the Constitution, even when it comes to this great experiment, um, it really only works, right? When people are morally driven and, and religiously bound, it's really inadequate. The laws in which it's written, but it's just inadequate to govern any other. Why? Well, even when you read the Bill of Rights, which again is an amazing, I can't go into everything today, but it's an amazing document. When you go back to read the original Bill of Rights, not even some of the amendments that were added, but you go back and read them, you'll see they're written in such a way that always brings to context the dependency we have to each other. Okay, it's not just about our right to free speech and our right to free, free press and our right to not have to quarter soldiers anymore. Does that make sense? Like, this is, I know that's not a big one we use nowadays, but that's a, that was one of our rights. When you read them, they're in context of one another. Because individual rights, this is what they knew, it must be coupled with individual responsibility to each other. Okay? Our individual rights are experienced in this dependent way of us having individual responsibility to each other. Here are the words. I wanted to make sure I was very clear with it. Not for one another. There are responsibilities that we take for one another in terms of ministry, in terms of calling as followers of Christ. But in terms of just the big picture, even just in terms of our country, that these rights, they're individually, they're driven by individual responsibility to one another right? Not for one another, because we're not going to own the responsibility of someone else, but to one another, because no man or woman is an island to themselves, okay? 
what you do affects me. What I do affects you. Nod your head if everybody can agree with me on this, right? So our individual rights still have to come along with individual responsibilities to one another, okay? I have free speech. I can say anything I want to you, okay, in this country. I also have to be responsible to you for the things that I say to you, right? I'm responsible for for that. I'm responsible for what words pass through my lips. I'm not just responsible to you, believe it or not, as a follower of Christ. I'm also responsible to God for the words that pass through my lips. So there's individual responsibility to one another. And if you take it even further, there's there's responsibility to God. How I want to talk about this this morning in context to how the church plays a role. The church plays a role in terms of our dynamic as a country right now. I want to go and just give an example from the Church of Galatia, okay? Now, the Church of Galatians, in Galatians, the Church of Galatia, Paul was writing them, and they were having some significant issues and struggles. You can go back and read all the chapters. This specific one we're going to read is a a specific issue where where the the people of God were sort of treating the old law, right, the, the Jewish law, they were kind of treating it the way we treat civil law. Okay, the way you and I treat civil law, which is we choose the stuff that we think is the most important to highlight, right? Don't pay attention to these ones over here. This is the most important law. This is the thing that's crazy important. Don't pay attention to no, no. Don't I said don't pay attention to those laws over there. This is, and that and it was all to accomplish an agenda. It was all to accomplish you know making them feel a certain way for the things that they felt like they were entitled to. I know it's nothing like America, okay? So just bear with me. I know it's nothing like our country. Just give me, just give me freedom. Let me read this from Paul's letter to this church who's struggling with this. He starts this. This is in uh, uh, verse, uh, sorry, chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 1 because this is my favorite verse. Christ has truly set us free. Make sure you stay free, right? Don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. This is Paul's heart for the church. Do not get tied up again in, this, in these issues of the law that have been settled. He sets you free. You, you, in Christ, you are now free. And the specific thing they were dealing with, just to let you know, was circumcision, okay? The Jews felt superior, and the people who followed the Jewish laws felt superior by this physical modification, and were forcing other people to do it to make them feel better. Again, not like America at all. Okay, I understand. They were forcing people to do something to make them feel better and to to sort of be like, all everybody's going to be in line with God if we just follow this one rule. Okay, keep going. And he later on, he says, you were running the race so well, who has held you back from following the truth? Like you were doing good, but something happened. You got tied up again. What happened? Who held you back? And he goes on to say, it certainly isn't God, for he's the one who called you to freedom. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but it's been for a long time, it's always been mankind's tendency to blame God for our problems, right? To blame God for the things that we're struggling with. It's always been our problem. He says, it certainly isn't God. I know you're blaming God. He says, but this false teaching, talking about this whole thing that circumcision gives you versus doesn't. It's a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough, okay? This one little problem. You've decided it's going to be one little law that you're going to uphold from the Jewish law, and I'm telling you, it's going to be a problem for the rest of the faith. It's going to be a problem for everything if you hold tightly to this. Then he goes on to say this, verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Other other versions say, to indulge your sinful nature, but rather serve one another humbly in love. You've been set free. There's a purpose with that freedom, to serve one another humbly and in love. The entire law is fulfilled by keeping this one command, talking about how Jesus summarized it, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the summary of the great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're going to keep all the laws if you simply do this. But if you bite and devour, let's just say those two words together. If you what? Bite. Bite. If you bite and, what's the word? Devour each other. Watch out. 
or you will be destroyed by each other. This is a principle that Paul kind of wanted the church to get under their understanding. Is like, look, there's a responsibility and a purpose to this freedom you've been given. I know you want to blame God for the division that you're seeing in this particular issue. But if you bite and devour one another over this, this false teaching, you're going to destroy one another. Now, just real quick, you know, who bites each other? No, no, I'm, I'm being very serious. Just think about it for a minute. Who, who resorts to biting? Children do, don't they? They just, I have no words to express it. Get over here right now. I'm going to bite your face. Okay? Who devours one another? Animals. Right? Paul is saying, do not act like children. Do not act like animals. Because you are more than that. You are so much more than that. You've been called free in Christ. But if you continue to act like children and you continue to act like animals, you will destroy one another. And this is for us the charge given to the church. And it is a charge that has a principle to it that we need to pay attention to, right? That all this division and discord and stuff that happens, with, whether it's within the church, whether it's within a country, doesn't matter. All the division and discord that we engage in always is rooted, it's always rooted in selfishness. It's always rooted in pride, right? When you divide, when you divide, it has to do with the individual fighting against an individual. It has nothing to do with anything else. It starts as a root of pride and selfishness. And let's just be honest, even the things that you claim to engage in division over that have, you don't think have anything to do with you. It has to do with a people group or a cause or whatever the case is. I'll be honest, it still has everything to do with you. You want to be seen morally superior. You want to be seen, you know, backing the right cause versus the wrong one, the right person versus the wrong person. It still has everything to do with you. There's still a root of division that comes in this sort of selfish, pride-driven way. Matter of fact, Paul says it this way to the church in Philippi. He says, I don't want you to do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. This is the whole passage where he talks about, you want, I want you to have the attitude that Jesus had. Don't do anything out of this selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above you. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Okay, that, that's, this, is, this is the sacrificial living that you'll see often referenced by Paul. To have the attitude that Christ did. Christ didn't see himself, the fact that he was God, as an entitlement. No, he lowered himself. He humbled himself and came in flesh, came in blood to suffer and experience what we experienced, that he could be the Savior of all. This wasn't a charge to Americans. This wasn't a charge. This was a charge to the people of God, the followers of Jesus, that no matter where you find yourself in, you cannot simply resort to division as a way of solving any problems, as a way of, as a way of, of solutions, because it never, it never comes up with a solution. This is what we're seeing in the church right now, and this is a, this is a problem. And this, is, this phrasing actually came from a conversation that uh, my wife and I were having with um, David McNeely. He was one of our teaching pastors here for several years. He's now pastoring a church in Florida. We got to see him a couple weeks ago. It was great to see them and their family. Uh, but we were just talking about, you know, just kind of the last couple years and what we've been seeing. And this is a phrasing that, re that, that really just hit the nail on the head for me because it was kind of where I was, where my heart was for this message, is that God's ecclesia, God's church, okay, the, we're talking about the big C church, Right? was really marked early on by its unity. And their unity was in theology and Christology. The reason I add Christology there is because, you know, from, from the time of the early church on, churches have struggled with allowing certain, I would call it secondary theological things, to, to divide them. Yet, they were able to still unite over the, what was the only thing that they needed to make sure they knelt over, which was who was Jesus. What was Jesus' role 
in our salvation. And so there's churches that, that can divide over, you know, speaking in tongues and other things that they make theological arguments about and doctrinal arguments about, but they still can unite in Christology. They can still unite over who Jesus is in their study of God. And that was how the church was marked, was in unity. And that has always been the goal. But, but what we're seeing more and more in the church is what we're seeing in our culture. It, it's people divided over social and political ideology. Social and political ideology has taken a front seat in the church and causes division. Social issues, social, social concerns, social justice issues, political affiliations, political alignments. The ideology, meaning that what would be ideal? Wouldn't it be great if everyone did this? And wouldn't it be great if no one ever did this? That's ideology. And in the church, we're seeing this division. Not over theology, not a God-centered view of the world, where man is broken and always moving away from God, never towards him, and why we all need Jesus. We're not uniting over those things. We're dividing over the problems of humanity. And here's the problem with social and political ideology. Humanity's the problem, but they also think humanity is the solution, Right? It's either like completely devastating and deplorable, the human nature, or it's altruistic, which means we assume the best. Oh, they would never take advantage of people. They would never do that. And, and, and they're still talking about humans. You guys with me? They're still talking about the problem and the solution. This is creeping its way into the church, and it's really causing a problem. Why? Because in, the ch- in a ch- country or a church, it doesn't matter. In the country or church, there's something built in. God built this into the fabric of the des- not design of humanity. Division is going to cause weakness and defunction, dysfunction, period. Division causes weakness and dysfunction. Unity unleashes power around purpose, period. Study history, study scripture. You're going to see it alive and examples in both, right? Division is always going to be the the step before nations fall. Division was always the step before churches fail. Division is always what happens, okay? And the more extreme it gets, the more polarizing it gets, there are no more problems that can be solved, right? Because destruction is the only other choice. That's, that's, a, that's something God built into humanity. So we see it in the church. We see it with God's church. We also see it in countries and nations. In the church, you see it as well. You see it, well, I was going to say one more example in the countries. Whether it's good, I just want you to hear this. It can be a good purpose or a bad purpose. We saw it with the Nazi regime, didn't we? That a unified group around that purpose was extraordinarily powerful and destructive to millions. We also saw it in the end of World War II, post Pearl Harbor, where the United States came and, and solidified and unified the Allied forces to win the victory. I mean, we see it in the good and the bad. The idea of unity. Destruction's the same way. I mean, divis- divisive, there's only the few possible good examples I can give you, but it, it works. It's just part of the nature of what God created. We see, and I love this, in Genesis 11, this is after the flood, and mankind has multiplied and multiplied. I think, I think Don, Pastor Don talked about this you know, a while back in, uh, in one of our Genesis things, but you know, you, you know, there's the Tower of Babel. If you don't know the story, it's just ridiculous. They, all people spoke the same language and kind of got together and started to build a city and started to build basically an empire that they wanted to reach God and become God. And they thought they could do it. And here's the problem. The words that are given to us is that they are people of one language and one purpose. And what they began to do, now no purpose, nothing they purpose will be impossible for them. This is what God said. Nothing they're going to do is going to be impossible for them because they're, they're together in one purpose. And they're together in one language, which is why he split the languages and he scattered the nations. Because their purpose was wrong. Their purpose wasn't right. 
And yet he brings them back. At Pentecost, he brings all the languages back to the unity of who Jesus is. Right? He brings all the nations back. He brings all the languages back. Language was not going to be a divider anymore when it came to the one thing that would unite, which would be the person of Jesus Christ. We see this, again, example, time after time after time. And I want the church to understand its role. Now, I'm going to give a really quick little, this is free, you didn't pay for this at all. This is just simple, little thing right here, okay? I want to talk about these two words and be very careful about them, nationalism and patriotism. There's, there's a little bit of an issue happening in the last several years of Christians kind of falling in line with what would be considered a kind of a Christian or nationalist movement in our country, and, it's, and nationalism is, it can be in any country, okay? It's just, it's just, a, it's just a best way to describe nationalism is just this idea of like, you know, God bless America and no one else. You guys with me on that? Right? Or, or God bless, we would never say that because we're much more ha- ha- lofty. So we'd say God bless America more than everybody else, right? Just make sure it's more God, right? And the problem with nationalism is it creeps into the church, it creeps into God's people because they claim one thing, they state one thing, they talk about Jesus as the Savior and God as the ruler and, and reigner, but they, but they respond and they react to cultural and social issues as if Trump or Biden is the Savior. You guys with me on that? No, nobody here. I'm talking about other people now, okay? I'm talking about other people. Okay, that's the problem with nationalism is it can creep into your testimony as a follower of Jesus if you're not careful because there is a way in which you and I function as if, as if what well, we, well, we say with God's in control, but we're absolutely convinced that the, that the country is going to hell in a handbasket unless we get the judi- judicial Supreme Court back. Everybody with me? Yeah, you don't have to confess right now. I'm just saying, I'm just saying like, this is, this is a problem. Now, patriotism in and by itself, I don't believe is a problem in our country. Matter of fact, I think the problem is that we don't have as many patriots as we should have. Patriotism to me is just the love and defense and willing to fight for the country that you are a part of. Okay, And I think of pastors all across this world that I love. David Lamiso is a great example. He's one of our um, partners in, in Kilgoris. He would absolutely consider himself a patriot of Kenya. Why? Because he loves Kenya, and he loves the people. And it's not without its faults, okay? It's not without its government's faults and problems, but he would be a patriot and fight for his country. And I believe there are Christians and, you know, that do that in America. They, they, but there's a line that you do have to be careful about, okay? That, you know, when you're a patriot and you're a Christian, you know, you are, you are one of those who wants to defend your country and would fight for your country. That's fine. But you need to understand you still are a temporary citizen, right? This is a temporary home to a heavenly citizenship. That's where we belong. And as long as we're treating it as if we're good stewards of the blessings we've been given. If you were, listen, if you're born here, you are already blessed. If you're born and raised in this country, you are blessed. And just like Jesus told us to do with our blessings, what did he do? You're the, you've been given five bags, baby. You better put that to work. You better use that investment. You better leverage what you've been given. People are born all over this country that don't have it. And you're called to use it. You're called to steward it well. That's my version. That's my view of patriotism. And I believe Christians should have that. Even with all the warts and faults and issues we see. But here's the deal. Okay, this, is why, this is why it happens. Nationalism creeps into Christian culture because for some reason, the church, just, church people just began to think that our country, our country was supposed to be the moral and religious conscience of the world. That was never the case. We already have, a, we already have something for that. It's called the church. It's called the kingdom of God. Okay? The church and the kingdom of God is, is all over every tribe, language, and tongue, and nation, and it's already there and poised and in position to be the moral and religious conscience of our countries and of this world if we were unified. You with me? Like that was, they already have its job. It wasn't supposed to be America's job. And that's how it bleeds into Christians. Here's where Paul writes the church in Ephesus. 
to always be humble and gentle and be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. You see these intentional words Paul uses? You're going to keep yourself together. You're going to bind yourself together united. There's only one body and one spirit. Just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There's one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. This is what's supposed to unite us. And this is what God's church is supposed to look like, right? God's ecclesia is supposed to be united in theology and Christology. We're not going to, listen, we're not going to unite over social and political ideology. We're not. I got news for you. I got tons of opinions. I got tons of convictions. I got tons of stances. They would not align with you at all. You, you with me? There's going to be something. You'd look at me, if we had a long conversation about all those ideologies, you'd look at me and be like, man, you're nuts. How could you possibly think that? Well, I do. That's just where I am in my life. But that's not what we're going to unite over. And I would never expect that to be the case. We unite over the fact that there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one God. And guess what? He's in all and working through all and over all. So why can't we be united? Well, why is this such an issue for the church? Well, because unity, unity can't be mandated. There's no branch of government, no judicial, no legislative, no executive branch of our government that can make anyone unite over anything, period. Can't do it. You can't make it into laws. The church can't somehow bring it into, churches try to bring it in, manipulating people with legalism. They try, but it cannot be mandated. Unity has to be chosen. It's individual responsibility to one another. No one's going to pass a bill of responsibility, right? Are you with me? No one's going to pass a bill of responsibility. We want our bill of rights. Here's your bill of responsibility. Oh, no, thank you. Government's responsible for that. Unity has to be chosen. Here's the beautiful picture. The church was meant to be the model. The church was meant to be the model. You've heard me say this before. Where else, what other institution in the world can bring people of such polarizing, opposite, sociological, and political ideals together around one table and have unity with one another? There's, no other, there's nothing else other than the church that could pull it off. The church was meant to be the inspiration to the world. It was meant to be the influence. It was meant to be the, the thing that people looked at and said, man, it's possible? It's possible? I want to read how it can be done. I'm just going to close very quickly with this. I just want to read Paul's letter to Romans when he was in prison and He's writing the church in Rome, and he's, he's kind of walking them through. He's giving them so much stuff up to this point, but he's talking specifically about the how-to. He's talking now in Romans about the kind of feet to the fire, pedal, you know, the, you know, pedal to the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the metal, kind of like this is how the action takes place. A lot of, a lot of theological stuff was important to talk about, but here's where, here's where we really get to it. And he tells him in Romans after he says, look, your whole body, your whole life is going to be a living sacrifice to God. That's what worship really is. And he goes on to say, I don't want you to copy the, the behaviors and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing how. Changing what? Say it out loud like it's true. Yeah. You're not supposed to conform to a mold of how the world thinks it should be done. I'm not supposed to copy these behaviors and patterns. You, you gotta, it starts, the transformation starts with changing how you think. Changing, changing your steps and your actions about it. It wasn't going to be the same way. Jesus told the disciples one time, they were arguing about <coughs> the kingdom of God. Jesus, who's going to be on your left and right? Can I be it? Can me and my brother do it? Because there's going to be like a throne, right? Everybody, everybody has a throne. Can we sit on the left and right of power of you? 
And Jesus says, as over in Mark, he said, look, guys, come here, teachable moment, teachable moment, come here, family meeting, okay? You know how the rulers of this world lord it over people and officials flaunt their authority over those under them? You know how, you know how the world does it? Yeah. He goes on to say this, but among you, it will be different. I love the NIV where it says, not so with you, okay? No more clear, you know, four words. Yeah. You know how they do all that? You know how the customs of this world and the behaviors? Yeah. Not so with you. Whoever wants to be the leader among you is going to be the servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave. We don't even like that word. You're going to be the slave to everyone else. Why? Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the attitude of Christ, right? So how do we continue to, to change the way we think, and what does it look like not to copy the patterns of this world? Well, I'm going to give you a quick example. This is Paul again continuing in Romans. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Okay, I could spend all day on this. Don't pretend to love others. I want you to really love them, right? Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good, okay? We might want to focus on the really love them part, but all these words are commands. Hate what's wrong. Hold tightly to what's good. Don't just say you love people. Really love them. Keep going. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other, right? Don't give lip service. Don't just say you love them. Don't fall into this pattern of the world, of what the world believes what loving someone looks like. We have to change the way we think. We're going to hold tightly to what's good. We're going to hate what's wrong. So here's a quick warning before I finish this passage in Romans and we close. And this is a big deal for us in our country, I just, in our culture. Let me put it in our culture, not just country. This is our culture, okay? You're going to have to, this is a tension that Paul brings out that, that you have to live in. There's no way to not live in this tension and do what Scripture's called us to do, all right? You must do blank to show me you love me. And I stole this last part from, from my wife because she's smarter than me. It's worldly thinking shrouded in virtue signaling. You must, you must agree with me about critical race theory in order to support me in racial reconciliation and to show me you love me. You must recognize my gender fluidity and my personal pronoun choices. You must affirm my sexual orientation and my lifestyle to show me you love me. You must support my legal reproductive rights that this country has given me. Fill in the blank. See, this is the worldly thinking. It's, it's, a, it's the worldly thinking of like, well, you have to do what I want you to do in order for you to show me that you love me. And I'm just telling you guys, don't even, don't even fall for it. It's a, it's a moving target. You'll never hit it. And do not engage in the shallow rhetoric of virtue signaling. I'm disgusted by it. Do not even engage in it. Hold tightly to what is good. Hate what is wrong. Don't say you love people. Really love them. And Jesus made it very clear what that was. As I've loved you, I want you to love others. Right? As I've loved you, I want you to love others. Well, what's that look like, God? Well, Matthew 25, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And they all went, Jesus, we never did this for you. And he said, yeah, but when you did it for the least of these, you did it to me. That's what real love looks like, putting them above you. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold to what is good, hold tightly to what is good, and I have no choice but to hate evil and hate what's wrong. But I can still show people that I really love them. I can. And why is there tension? 
because the world has no box for this. The world has no place, their culture has no place for what it means to honor someone, to love your neighbor. Remember how we define neighbor at this church? Someone who doesn't look like you, who doesn't think like you, who doesn't believe like you. There's no box for them on why I would feed them, clothe them, love them, care for them, serve them, and honor them when they've told me that the only way to love me is this way. And I'm just like, that is not what scripture says. Here's how I love you. Here's how what love looks like. And there's no place in our culture for that. There's no, there's no category. There's no red box or blue box that that fits into. And so there's tension. But guys, that's the tension we are called to. That's the tension we're going to live in so that we can remain united in Christ and not divided over the ideology. Continues on to say this in Romans. I want you to bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony, that's the united thing, with one another. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Don't think you know it all. <laughs> Woo! I wanted to say it, but I'm so glad Scripture says it. I just get to say it. And it's not my fault. You can be mad at me. You can be mad at Jesus. Be mad at God, right? Don't think you know it all. Lord, Jesus, help us. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable and do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. Guys, you can't control what other people do. You really can't. You cannot control what other people do, but you can do all that you can to live at peace with others. To, to, to say, listen, you may not want to unite with me because of the social and political issues we're not going to agree on, but I want to unite with you. I want to, I want to unite with you because of the, the, what Jesus has called me to do. And I want to bless you and I want to honor you and I want to show you what love looks like. That's never changed. Your version of love is a moving target. I will never hit it. I might hit it today. I'm going to miss it tomorrow. But I have the word of God that tells me what love really looks like, and I can continue to do it. To love you. And to love you well. James Madison is known as the, um, kind of the father of the Constitution. They've called him that because he had a big role in kind of bringing things together, fourth president. And here's a, a great statement he made in one of his inaugural addresses, all right? It's got some few weird words in it, so I'll kind of walk you through. He said, there are no theoretical checks and no form of government that can render us secure. Okay, this is early on. Everything, the experiment was still really new. He just wanted them to understand, like, this isn't the government's responsible for to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people, without any character, without any, you want to love them, really love them, in them. It's a chimerical idea. Chimerical is just a word that's used with a lot of fantasy and, and um, um, fairy tale illusions. You know, it's like, the, it's like a snake body with a lion head. You guys know what I'm talking about? Chimerical, the root of the word means they're, they're pieces that don't go together. You can't, I mean, it's great for fantasy. They don't really go together. It's a chimerical idea to assume that the government's going to be responsible for and can accomplish the things that you altruistically think that they will do without it coming from the individual responsibilities to one another and the dependency that we have on one another to experience our independence. Doesn't happen. Dependent and independence is something I just want us to think about as you celebrate today, okay? Celebrating. I want you to celebrate Independence Day. We live in this incredible, amazing country. I want us to celebrate it well. Celebrate with your family. Make sure your family knows why you're celebrating today. And, and, and remember our role, okay? Our role is the church is supposed to go first. The church is supposed to be a model 
of what it means to unite, even though we're going to disagree. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm telling you, we are not always going to agree on social and political ideology. Wouldn't it be great if? Wouldn't it be great if no one ever? Wouldn't it be great if we all just? Okay, we're not going to agree on that. We're not supposed to unite over that. We're supposed to unite, okay, as a church, unite over who Jesus is and what he does to bring us together. And I'm just saying it, myself, last couple years, the church as a whole, our church, you, you, may, have, you may have allowed, because it's a, it's a pattern and custom of this world, the world, our culture did a fantastic job of helping us assume the worst of everyone. And I'm just telling you, as many of you guys have, have allowed division and discord to creep into your hearts about other believers and other people in this church, you just need to repent about that. Repentance is easy. Repentance is recognize you're wrong and say you're sorry. That's it. Recognize you're wrong and say you're sorry. And I've had to have personal times of just, you know, things I've, you know, you don't know it because I don't post it. I'm much smarter than you. Um, <laughs> but I've had division creep up in my heart over posts and, and issues and conversations and, and things that I've heard and comments to me, and I feel it in me. And I have to remember that that's not the goal. And the division is the enemy. The division and discord that I was feeling was the enemy, and I needed to recognize I was wrong and repent and say I'm sorry to God because I was going to, no matter what, I don't care what you, I don't know, I don't care that we are so polar opposites. I love you. And I'm going to unite with you in Jesus Christ. And you and I are going to be the model. You and I are going to go first. You guys, you, you listen, we're going to be the example of a church that does not divide over social and political ideology. But we will absolutely unite because of who Jesus is. Let's pray together. Father God, I'm just thankful for this country. Um, just warts and all. Just failures and all. Um, you've, you've taken us a long way and you're going to continue to take us even further. God, I pray for our leaders. I pray for those right now who are having to make decisions that, gosh, I don't even know if I would be able to make. God, I pray for the churches in this country that are reeling from the division over social and political issues and ideologies that they were never supposed to, that the enemy has crept in the door and, and has gotten a foothold in the hearts of believers. God, would you just change us, challenge us, help us repent of those things? Today, as we celebrate independence, may we remember the dependency we have on one another. God, that's because of what you gave us. It's the model you showed us. That we're called to live in this world to one another. God, it's only by your grace and it's only by your spirit that you give us the power to do so. We are so weak in our flesh. We are so weak in our human nature. Jesus it's got to be you. It's got to be you through us. And I pray that all over the world, that as churches begin to make this turn, we would regain the influence, the right kind of influence and unity to become the conscience for the world. God, it's only for your kingdom that we strive and, and, and live to see people be a part of and your kingdom at work and the lives of, of people this church, the lives of this community that we want to connect with and be unified with that we can begin to see the changes you want us to see. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen.